Welcome to the lecture on dentine. This is the hard tissue of the tooth which is the most resilient. It supports the enamel on top and protects the pulp in the center. In the root portion, the dentine is covered by the cementum which further attaches to the alveolar bone via the periodontal ligament. The dentine forms before the enamel. After the amylogenesis, the dentine continues to grow and gives bulk and shape to the tooth. It is formed by odontoblasts which are differentiated from the dental papilla cells. Unlike enamel, dentine is tubular in nature. Physically and chemically, it resembles bone. Osteoblasts are lining the bone. Similarly, odontoblasts line and there are processes within the dentine. This diagrammatic representation shows us the tubular nature of dentine. Each of these odontoblasts have an odontoblastic process that runs within the dentine. In cross section, the dentine is seen as tubular nature with multiple holes. The odontoblastic processes, they branch and are in contact with each other. Within the pulp, the blood vessels, undifferentiated mesenchymal cells, fibroblasts, etc. support the odontoblastic zone. Just below the odontoblastic zone, there is a cell-free zone which allows the odontoblast to move backward when dentine is being deposited. Before the mineralized dentine, there is a small zone of pre-dentine which is predominantly made up of type 1 collagen. Let's look at the physical and chemical properties of dentine. Dentine is yellowish in nature and as the dentine increases with age, the tooth tends to become yellowish with age. It is more elastic than enamel and resists slight deformation. Enamel is very brittle. Without the support of the dentine, it would fracture very easily. It is harder than bone but softer than enamel and it tends to be harder near the pulp than at the dentinoenamel junction. The primary dentition is less harder than the permanent dentition. It has 35% organic component and 65% inorganic component. The organic component predominantly consists of type 1 collagen. However, mucopolysaccharides, chondroitin sulfate, decorin, biglycan, dentine xyloprotein, osteonectin are the other organic components. The inorganic component is predominantly made up of hydroxyapatite crystals. The shape is like a plate and is smaller than that seen in the enamel. The hydroxyapatite crystals in enamel are hexagonal in shape and needle shaped when you see it under low power. The odontoblasts are arranged in a layer close to the pulpal surface of the dentine. These odontoblastic processes extend within the dentinal tubule. As the age advances, these odontoblasts tend to converge towards the pulp, giving rise to a multi-layered appearance. The dentinal tubules have a characteristic S shape and the S shape is called as the primary curvature of the dentine. All the tubules extends from the pulp in the center to the dentinoenamel junction in the crown and the dentinocemental junction in the root. These tubules are always showing a characteristic curve in which the first convexity is towards the apex of the tooth. The second convexity is towards the crown of the tooth. These primary curvatures are not a straight line. They form small undulations which is represented as the secondary curvature of the dentine. These undulations make the dentinal tubule much longer than the dentine width as seen histologically. At the end of the dentinoenamel junction, the Y-shaped dentinal tubules are seen. These are nothing but branching of the dentinal tubules. This increases the surface area at the dentinoenamel junction, allowing more contact of the dentinal fluid 
making the tooth more sensitive at the dentinoenamel junction. This terminal branching is more prominent and you can make out the electron microscopic appearance in this diagram. Apart from the terminal Y-shaped branching, there are also lateral branching that is noted. These allow the dentinal tubules to communicate with each other and the odontoblasts work in synergy to maintain the vitality of the tooth. These dentinal tubules are more concentrated at the pulpal surface. The surface area at the dentinal enamel junction is much more. All the dentinal tubules converge at the pulpal surface, making it around 50,000 to 90,000 tubules per millimeter square. The outer surface is one fourth as that of the pulpal concentration. Some of the dentinal tubules tend to enter into the enamel. This gives rise to a spindle shaped dark outline called as the enamel spindles. The dentine is formed in a rhythmic manner. Right around the odontoblastic process, there is an empty space filled up with the dentinal fluid. The odontoblasts and the odontoblastic processes produce dentine adjacent to it which is much more denser. It is called as the peritubular dentine. Between the two tubules, there is a coarse dentinal tubule called as the intertubular dentine. The peritubular dentine and the intertubular dentine differ in composition. Here you can make out the peritubular dentine is much more dense than the intertubular dentine. The dentinal tubule is narrower at the dentinoenamel junction and peritubular dentine is thicker at the outer dentine than at the inner dentine. Further pictures which show the more dense peritubular dentine. Within the peritubular dentine, the empty space contains the periodontoblastic space filled up with the dentinal fluid. In the center, you may find the odontoblastic process. Dentine is formed by the odontoblastic process on the inside. Thus, intratubular dentine is a more preferred term than the peritubular dentine. The odontoblastic processes are seen as extensions within the dentinal tubules as visualized in this histopathological section. They are largest at the pulp and tapers towards the dentinal enamel junction. Around 3 to 4 microns to 1 micron taper is visualized. These processes extend throughout the tubules. It is controversial. However, some agree that it extends, some say it may not. The odontoblastic process, periodontoblastic space containing glycosaminoglycans and the dentinal fluid rich in potassium ions and a membrane called lamina limitans constitute the components of a dentinal tubule. Predentine is an unmineralized component of dentine. The predentine roughly forms 2 to 6 micron thick area above the odontoblastic zone. There are three types of dentine that are visualized. One is primary, secondary and tertiary. The primary dentine is divided into mantle dentine which is also called as the first form dentine. This forms the outermost zone of the dentine. Just below the enamel or below the cementum, you see a linearly mineralized dentine called as the mantle dentine which constitutes around 20 microns width. Around the pulp, you see the circumpulpal dentine. Von Croft fibers. These are unique argyrophilic fibers which characteristically show silver staining. They show characteristic bands as visualized here and they are thought to be type 3 collagen. They are directed perpendicular to the dentinoenamel junction. However, it may or may not be collagen. That is the controversy that has to be discussed. The secondary dentine is that dentine which is formed after the root is completed or the apex has been decided. It usually forms the innermost surface of the dentine. If you understand this histology, you can see the tubular nature and there is sudden change in direction of the dentinal tubules. And this sudden change in the direction of the dentinal tubules is called the secondary dentine. The change in the direction of the dentinal tubules that you note 
is because of the physiological changes seen in the odontoblastic layer after the root completion is over. You can make out the change in the direction more prominently in this higher magnification. The tertiary dentine on the other hand is a dentine that is formed in response to a stimuli. It is a reparative phenomenon and thus is also called as reparative dentine. Like in enamel, dentine also has incremental lines. As you can see here, a prominent incremental line that usually follows the contour of the pulp chamber. Daily incremental lines of 4 to 8 micron with perpendicular to the dentinal tubules are called as von Ebner's lines. Some incremental lines are accentuated because of the coincidence of the secondary curvature of the dentine. These lines are called as contour lines of Owen. An accentuated contour line is usually visualized as a hypocalcified zone called as the neonatal line. Dentine formed before birth is of a better quality and is separated by a hypocalcified line called the neonatal line similar to that of enamel. This is the classification that we had covered. How does it differ? The mantle dentine is the first formed dentine is found adjacent to the dentino enamel junction. It also shows linear mineralization. Circumpulpal dentine on the other hand is second formed and shows globular mineralization. In this example, there are multiple globules of minerals or initiation points. These globules tend to enlarge. As they enlarge, they leave some spaces which are hypomineralized. These are called as interglobular dentine. Each of these globular mineralization zones are called as calcospherites. These hypocalcified areas of interglobular dentine show the collagen fibers or the dentinal tubules passing through them. In a transmitted light, they look light and in a reflected light, they look black. This is more prominent at the junction of the mantle and the circumpulpal dentine. The Tomes granular layer is a phenomenon seen on the root. Adjacent to the cementum, there is a transparent layer of hyaline layer of Hopewell Smith. Because of the looping and coalescing of the dentinal tubules, the cross section appears as granules. Here you can make out the hyaline layer of Hopewell Smith and the dentinal tubules cross sections. Dentine is a dynamic tissue. It has various age changes. Dentine is a vital tissue with the dentinal fluid moving in and out of it. And they react to various pathological stimuli like dentinal caries, abrasion, attrition or it may be an iatrogenic cause where the cavity is being prepared. Dentine unlike enamel is formed throughout life and can regenerate. Here is an example of attrition. This may be physiological or pathological. Physiological attrition may be because of constant chewing, clenching of the teeth and pathological may be due to a muscular difference in the chewing habit like night grinding or bruxism. Abrasion on the other hand is a pathological phenomenon where there is mechanical abrasion of the cervical portion of the tooth because of improper tooth brushing. Erosion is a chemical phenomenon in which regurgitation or carbonic drinks may lead to demineralization and erosion of the tooth surface. Whatever be it, whenever the enamel is gone, the dentine reacts giving rise to some amount of sclerosis because the odontoblastic processes deposit dentine and removes the refractory index difference. In case of a slow injury, the sclerosis is seen and represented as reparative or reactionary dentine. If the injury is fast and the odontoblastic process does not have enough time to fill up the dentinal tubule, they are filled up with air and are called as dead tracts. A sclerotic or transparent dentine is mainly because of the refractive index becomes equal between 
the peritubular and the intertubular dentin. So, in this photograph, you can make out that the mesh work is seen through the tooth surface. It is a defensive mechanism. It occurs with age and this principle of transparent dentin has been used in age estimation techniques. Clinically, the transparent dentin is harder but is more brittle because it loses the resilience of the collagen fibers that are predominant in a normal dentin. It's a normal phenomenon which occurs by around third decade, the premolars start showing the transparent dentine. Caries accentuates the sclerotic dentine and once sclerotic dentine is formed, it prevents the further penetration of the organism. Reparative dentine has been divided into two terms. One is called reparative dentine where the odontoblasts are dead and new odontoblasts develop from the dentine. When due to an external injury, the odontoblast is not dead yet, they are reacting to the stimulus, they are called as reactionary or regenerated dentine. Histologically, the tertiary dentine are same tubular structure having fewer or twisted tubules. Sometimes the rate of development of this tertiary dentine is so fast that the odontoblasts get incorporated in it and form the osteodentine. The dead tracts are because of the degeneration of the odontoblasts. The dentinal tubules that were supposed to be supplied by these odontoblasts get filled up with air and they appear black in transmitted light and white in reflected light. Here is an example of a dead tract. The dentinogenesis usually begins in the late bell stage. It begins at the cusp tips. First the dentine is formed, reaction to that is the amylogenesis. The odontoblasts which are differentiated from the dental papilla cells and they divide into two dissimilar cells. These precursor cells are obligatory asynchronous dividers. They divide in such a way that one differentiates to form the odontoblast whereas the other remains undifferentiated and is one signal short of becoming an odontoblast. The signals which stimulate include the transforming growth factor beta, insulin-like growth factor, bone morphogenic protein, etc. Once this develops, the mesenchymal cells which are underlying also differentiate. Here is an example of the amyloblasts and the odontoblasts and the mineralization has begun at the interface. The odontoblasts increase in length, develop processes called as odontogenic processes. They are also called as tomes fibers. They are rich in Golgi apparatus and rough endoplasmic reticulum. Once these odontoblasts differentiate, they lay down a layer of collagen matrix called as predentine. This matrix is then deposited with lot of crystals. These proteins and crystals together play an important role in mineralization. The various mineral proteins are dentine phosphoprotein which are anionic and they attract more of calcium and controls the growth of an apatite crystals. Once the initiation has taken place, osteopontin increases the mineralization. When the two big globular masses of mineralization are contacting each other, they are inhibited by the presence of osteonectin. They promote adhesion to the collagen fibers. The odontoblasts actually release all these contents in a matrix vesicle. This vesicle not only contains crystals but also various growth factors and protein. Once they are released, they get incorporated inside the collagen fibers. Collagen has a typical 64 nanometer quarter stagger pattern and these have some pores in between and these pores allow the penetration of the crystals. Once the initiation has taken place, they grow and they become mineralized. The type of mineralization as discussed previously, the mantle dentine shows a linear mineralization whereas the circumpulpal dentine shows a globular mineralization in the form of calcospherite. The dentinal tubules continues to form at a rate of 1 micron per day. The reparative dentine however can be much faster up to 4 microns per day and the speed may also incorporate odontoblasts leading to osteodentine formation. Clinically, it increases the spread of caries when the organism enters the dentine because it's tubular in nature. Not only that, 
the branching at the dentino enamel junction causes a lateral spread of caries. So externally it may look like a small pit but internally it may be a big cavity. The host immunity plays an important role in preventing the spread of caries. Sclerotic dentine and reparative dentine formation prevents the further spread of caries into the tooth. Air driven cutting instruments like aerotors and micromotors cause desiccation of the dentine pulling the dentinal fluid and aspiration of these fluid into the dentinal tubule. The surface shows a fine powder of dentine called as the smear layer which contains debris as well as bacteria. The smear layer temporarily occludes the tubules and reduces the permeability and sensitivity. These stimulus initiates the odontoblasts to form reparative dentine. Vitamin D typically, theoretically, should show reduction in the dentine formation, however it does not. Incorporation of the fluoride hardens the dentinal tubule to a certain extent. The most important feature about dentine is the dentine sensitivity. Once the dentine is exposed, it shows sensitivity. This could be iatrogenic or microbial. There are three theories of dentine sensitivity. Direct innovation theory, transduction theory, and hydrodynamic theory. The direct innovation theory states that a nerve fiber enters along with the odontoblastic process and ends till the tip of the dentinal tubule at the dentinal enamel junction. However, it does not explain the maximum sensitivity that is seen at the dentinal enamel junction as there is only one nerve fiber ending there. The nerve fibers should be stopping the pain once local anesthetic is placed on top of them. However, this does not happen. The nerve is also not demonstrated to extend to the full length of the tubule. Hence, these factors do not support the direct innervation theory. The transduction theory on the other hand believes that the odontoblasts which are derived from the neural crestal cells have a possibility of having a synapse with the nerve. The odontoblasts and the odontoblastic process which branch at the dentino enamel junction are stimulated by the injury on top and the signal is transduced through the odontoblastic cell and the body goes through the nerve causing stimulation. But immunohistochemical studies have shown no neurotransmitters which are to be demonstrated neither are any synapses demonstrated. However, it does support the theory that there is increased sensitivity at the dentino enamel junction. The most accepted theory is however the hydrodynamic theory. The hydrodynamic theory states that the odontoblastic zone and the odontoblastic process need not enter the full length of the dentinal tubule. The dentinal tubule however is filled up with dentinal fluid which has increased surface area where at the dentino enamel junction the y-shaped dentinal tubules are formed. Due to desiccation, due to movement or any microbial stimulation, this fluid moves and leads to trigger of movement at the pulp chamber. The nerve endings at the pulp chamber sense this and this explains why local anesthesia doesn't work, also explains why dentino enamel junction has the highest sensitivity. This by far is the most accepted theory of dentinal sensitivity. To conclude, the structure of dentine forms the bulk of the tooth and gives vitality to the tooth and it is reparative and forms throughout the life. The clinical significance as well as the various properties of the dentine help in restoring the tooth as well as has other utilities like age estimation in forensic odontology. Thank you.